my name is Kayetan. I work for InnoGames at this moment. And I'll be talking today about what we learned and how we improved performance of PF. Let me introduce myself. I had wonderful opportunity to make a computer networking neighborhood in Poland. I mean, internet wasn't that fast back then. Come on, 115 kilobits for 15 people, woohoo. I worked for some ISPs who used to do just Ethernet cables to people houses. And correctly, I'm director of the internet at InnoGames. Yeah, you see, it's officially on my desk. How cool is that? And unfortunately, not on the paper. Um, the topics I want to cover today is how we use FreeBSD at InnoGames. What is a distributed denial of service attack? How they influence PF? How can we make PF more resilient, or how we cannot sometimes? What performance can we expect? And further work, which means patches we use at InnoGames, and that maybe could be used in PF generally, and conclusions at the end. Anyway, so first things first, how we use FreeBSD. Uh, we use load balancers. When you see this HWAV, HWLB, that stands for hardware load balancer. I might use this in the presentation a few times. Anyway, so we use 36 hardware machines for load balancing the traffic. They use FreeBSD 10.1. Do not ask me to update it. There's too many patches to port, and it works. Um, quite often, we still have one gigabit Broadcom cards just because they were there. But we have some machines with 10 gig Intel cards, and the 10 gig cards support multiple QEs. The Broadcom card should do it, but eh, for some reason it doesn't work. The code is just hashed out in the uh, in the in the source. I seen Dragonfly BSD maybe should be able to do with this. Open BSD and NetBSD also don't support this from what I've seen. Huh? Oh yeah, I know. Oh, it has it has uh, even more awesome features when you when you have this in a blade machine, because then the transceiver is in fact not in the server but outside behind the fabric, and it's remote um, transceiver, and those drivers in BSD didn't support it for some time at all, and um, well, it still sometimes crashes when you like run firmware upgrade on the blade center. Beauty. Anyway. Um, load balancers, we use the root2 target, which basically rewrites the MAC address and sends your public traffic through your internal network. So you need the public IP on the machine itself on the loopback interface. This allows us if we want direct server return in one day in future. Other way would be like NAT or something, but NAT is evil, and especially in IP6, we wouldn't like it. We don't do IP6 yet, but again, that would probably work. PFSync doesn't work with root 2, so we cannot use it. Um, PF is also used to firewall service servers when they want to access the internet, because to be honest, most of the servers in data center should not access the internet. Uh, ah, I didn't say about numbers. There were 36 uh, hardware load balancers because we have like 5,000 virtual machines behind it, located on 400, over 400 hypervisors. Yeah, uh, that's the scale. Um, we share the load balancers. Big games get like two active ones, so some IP addresses are routed through one load balancer, some from, uh, from another. The backup one can kick in if something dies using CARP at BGP on the public side, or two CARPs with the older setup, we still have it. And of course, for smaller projects, we have like multiple VLANs, and again, one master, one backup load balancer. This is the traffic we get. The display is suboptimal. But here you can see this is just traffic from one of the load balancers. The spikes here are like seven, uh, 600 Mbits per second. Usually it's like four or 500. This is from one of the bigger games. That gives us four to, yeah, 600,000 packets per second. This is just one of the load balancers. We have the biggest one, I must say, but other ones also do it. And in terms of how much PF is used, here you get like four, uh, 450,000 of states. So that's quite a lot, and of course there are operations like adding, deleting the states. Yeah, of course you get state search. As much as packets per second you get basically, but there are like 
what's the red one? State removal, like 1,000 states per second must be always re removed every second. Um, why have we chosen FreeBSD? I think this is the very important answer when you work for a big company, it's historical reasons. When I came here, it was there. Nobody really had time to change it. I heard stories about the guy who used to work there before about using LVS. It was told to be slow, whatever it means. I don't know what it means in, in, in their terms. I still say that, I mean, I wouldn't believe it was worse than FreeBSD when I started working with FreeBSD there because it already had very awesome bugs. But hey, now it works. I still say LVS probably could also work, but I mean, you cannot change what already runs there and you have customers paying th through those machines, basically. Other thing we use um, FreeBSD for is routers. We have three data centers, so that gives us six routers. Routers basically accumulate all the internal VLANs and therefore they filter traffic between them. They also provide routing between data centers that transport mode IPsec. Uh, <gasps> it's not really great. It's IPIP. I lied to you. But it doesn't make much difference, yes, because you have to en uh, encrypt it with transport mode, not the tunnel mode, and then there's OSPF running inside. Not the best choice. I would replace it with BGP, but for historical reasons. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, the problem that bothers us at InnoGains are distributed denial of service attacks. This is a really big issue. We have them like every day. So what is such attack? First of all, there's like no, you know, evil hackers. No data is being stolen. People don't really get into our servers. Okay, they do for other services like forums where you have some plugins installed, etc. whatever community managers need, but that's a different topic. But basically, DDoS attack is about denying normal paying customers denial, um, accessing the service. Block other players from defending their villages. Yes, really. I do not recall anybody asking us for money to stop attacking. Uh, they just launch attack that lasts like three, four minutes. Sometimes it will be repeated overnight whenever his army goes to the village so that people playing other village cannot defend it. I mean, how awesome is that? Yes, that's a, that's a really nice use case. Um, so how would you stop a other player from playing the game? Well, you could just have your computer and press F5 in your browser like very fast. Or, I don't know, hire some Chinese people. They do things fast. And... Huh? Exactly, this will be on next slide. So yeah, that, that, I, I just propose. How do you block people, yeah? F5, F5. No, 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 it, it doesn't work, yeah? Bigger thing, you could have like a botnet and control this botnet, but well, you need some control over the botnet, yes? Not, not everybody has such control, not everybody can afford the botnet. Well, of course, you get much more packets per second or other requests per second. And still, it's not what people do. What people do, usually, what we, what we noticed, it, from my perspective, are attacks with reflection. That means that the attacker fakes his source IP to pretend that he is our data center or one of the services. Then he sends some types of requests to totally legitimate servers in the internet, and then they send replies to us. Well, again, innocent, uninfected, because again, he doesn't need to really control over those machines. They just have to be wrongly configure, configured. So innocent machines will perform the attack for the guy or the girl, I don't know. And um, yet this is kind of, I would say, extra paperwork because sometimes after such attacks we get like emails, oh, you are asking our NTP server for so much data, and I'm like, no. It's somebody else asking, pretending to be us, and then you send the traffic back. Yeah, so I would call it extra paperwork, at least some emails to answer each time. So how is it possible? Internet providers, data centers, do not verify source address of packets coming from their networks. Um, I tested it, yes, with one of the German providers. I basically was sending fake source IP. Uh, fake source packets with fake source IP, and not all, so there must be some kind of filtering, but some of those packets were in fact reaching my network. I haven't tried that from home. Those numbers are, I, I don't remember honestly where I took them from. I'm sorry. 
it was like last year, so maybe the numbers, I, I think for this year, this 300 gigabytes, gigabits per second is already outdated. But anyway, you basically can ask DNS servers or NTP servers. For NTP, the attack goes basically, send one UDP frame and tell, and tell, tell me which, which um, what are your clients, oh mighty NTP server. And NTP server sends you up to 500 times more data back as UDP. You can do the same with DNS. There's, I think with DNSSEC you can get more. And again, I think for this year, this should be like 400 gigs or something. Again, we are not a bank. We are not having this great privilege of having uh, attacks lasting days against us, which happens to other customers. As I said, custom, yes. You had that, days. Yeah, again, for us it's not days. Sometimes it will be like a recurring attack. Some players decides to, so, so it will be like multiple few minutes attacks. Yeah, but it can last, in fact, days over and over. But again, not, not, not um, how do I say that? Not, what's the word? Not long time at once, yeah? Anyway, so what is targeted by such attacks? Or rather, what type of attacks we see? Um, what we noticed are UDP-based reflection, as I said there before. You can do it with NTP, um, SNMP, and other stuff. This will be basically a link saturating your network links. Not only yours, also your data center's network link. Because even if data center has like multiple 10 gig cables, well, maybe some of them is already at 7 gig and um, traffic just comes through that link. You can like, lose partially just routing from some places. Um, of course, it can kill your links. Um, at Hino Games, we at this moment have in data centers in Europe, we have in each data centers two 10 gig links. And yes, we've seen attacks killing them, although not always. Usually they're a bit smaller. Um, other things we usually see, they were like TCP SYN floods. They were like less uh, popular for some time. And this year, I see them again. Last year, I concentrated mostly on defending against UDP attacks. So again, whatever listens on a TCP port, including a firewall that the traffic has to go through, that will basically res result in some kind of resource depletion. I will talk today about what happens to PF when you have such a SYN flood. I've seen ECMP traffic. I have no idea where it comes from. Maybe it's some kind of side effect. Um, I've seen a few things that unfortunately I didn't have, um, I didn't take samples of because I, I, I sample traffic for UDP and uh, TCP SYN, and I see something else. I suppose it could be TCP fragment attack. I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, most popular, clog your links or clog your firewall. Anyway, so what happens to a SYN flood? If you, if you send a SYN packet to your load balancer, which runs PF in our case, you will end up having a state, or rather two, because you have state on the public side, which says routed to internal network, and then you have state on the internal side, which just say accept this traffic to the internal network. So for each SYN, you have two such uh, states. Um, that's pretty bad, because if the attack is like 200,000 SYNs per second, you get 200,000 new states created per second. PF doesn't like that. Um, another problem, um, source node entries will also be created. This is uh, also bad because you also limit them. Depends, but for quite many services we use source nodes uh, because we basically have multiple web servers running whatever application. I will not name the language anymore. <laughs> and the point is we want that when a player connects to a server that he stays there. There's some kind of session caching. I'm not entirely sure how it works in applications, but I heard that for games at least we like players to stay on the server to which they connect once. Um, although if they get connected to other one, it will still work. It will be just slower because something has to be recreated on the server. Um, yeah, you set always some kind of limit on your, on your uh, system. Uh, and you will hit the limit. Events cost your CPU time, so just the fact of creating and deleting stuff costs the time. And well, they, they, st they are still alive. It's not like it disappears in, a, in, in the same moment. You basically have this um, opening state of your state in PF, and this stays for some time. So because you wait for sin, synac, or another sin, yeah, but you want to keep them up. Um, UDP flat, as I mentioned before, 
it's basically saturation of links. I will not talk about them that much today, today even on firewalls, because we introduced traffic shaping on switches. Because we do not serve any UDP-based services, apart from uh, some DNS. And basically, with good enough switches, you can create policies to basically kill this directly when it comes from uplinks, and it doesn't go to the inside of your network. I didn't block it. I just limited like 50 megabits per second per uplink, and that's totally enough. Unless it kills uplink totally. Or maybe data center could do it for us, but they don't. Uh, how do we protect ourselves? Well, there are multiple ways. You want to probably increase um, capacity of your network. I mean, 10 gig is now what we have, but even the data center we are in doesn't have anything bigger than 10 gig. Uh, dynamic quality of service on attack detection, this is clickable. Okay, click, click. Uh, I can give you a link to my website. There's other presentation I did uh, some time ago somewhere else about how we really detect attacks dynamically and how we reconfigure switches. Permanent QoS, this is what I mentioned already, because we do not have UDP-based services, so we can limit this traffic like immediately, even without dynamic configuration. External attack mitigation services, there are some companies who do it for you. There are multiple setups. The setup we use is basically tunnel to them, um, advertise each of slash 24s we have to them, they advertise us through internet, and then they do magic. At least you hope. Uh, there are false positives, there are not detected attacks, but usually it works, and I'm afraid you want such service. And well, today, today's topic, improving of PF. That's also a way of protecting. Well, so how, how, how such attack um, influences uh, PF? Well, it will kill your router. That's basically end of story. Router slash load balancer. Because if you have a SYN flat and it creates hundreds of thousands of states per second, and as I said, the numbers are hundreds of thousands of states, this will basically kill your machine. Um, blah, 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 limit is reached, yeah? If you say, I allow one million of states on my machine, if there is more, legitimate customers will not be able to connect, even if your PF can handle it. Uh, as I said, because of internal states, you will have double amount of rules, uh, double amount of states, here I say pass in on public. If the traffic goes to this one, uh, route it to some other machine, yeah? But then it still has to leave your machine, uh, your load balancer, and you want to pass out that traffic. Unless you maybe skip it on the internal interface. But usually you will have the second one. Source nodes will be hit and will hit the limit. And the question is how much the performance drops with um, increasing amount of states? Uh, you mean uh, CPU cache? Yeah, of course, that's true. Um, what I like is that thanks to DDoSes, I managed to discover some uh, bugs in PF code. I mean, this is my favorite one. Yeah, just you have one million of states, one million of source nodes, and then try to remove them if somebody <laughs> asks for removing them. We have the um, internal tool called test tool. What an inventional name that basically configures the contents of uh, tables in PF basic, uh, basing on if the servers behind PF are alive or not. Um, and yes, it might want to disconnect people from a servers which, which died. And if you happen to be under DDoS attack and you want to remove this one, bad things happen. Um, yeah, you can, because of DDoSes, we could discover some um, performance issues like Code was searching for source nodes two times. You don't really see it on normal graphs. But if you have like very many packets per second and you say like, why? Why do I have 100,000 sins per second but I make 200,000 searches? You probably wouldn't see it under normal conditions. Uh, PF Purge is responsible for removing states. This, was, this, was, this is fixed in FreeBSD 10, but I fixed it personally for FreeBSD 9. And basically, PF Purge runs like once a second on BSD 9, uh, 9, I think. And then makes uh, purges the table in very big chunks, which basically was freezing the network from time to time. It was just better to do it more often with uh, smaller steps. I have no idea how it works, this part in different BSD. This, as I checked the code, this is still in open BSD. Other ones I never checked. <laughs> 
I will. I, I'll be very happy because, well, it's for good of all of us. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is very ugly. Yeah, if, uh, especially with uh, BSD9, it was like total freeze because then you don't get any traffic going through your network because there's a global lock. And well, that's basically end of story for your router. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, how can we make PF more resilient even if we have fixed the bugs? To be honest, the bugs I think were a very big, um, very, very important to this. But how can we make it more resi uh, resilient without touching the code? Well, you could just use the timers on, um, timers, timeouts, sorry, on the, on states. I mean, the TCP established is by default like 24 hours. We serve browser games and people will click once every 24 hours more often. We reduce this to like one hour. Uh, nobody of players ever complained. We get like 30% less states. Yes, they are there. That's a good question. I just wanted the numbers to be smaller even without attacks, yes? Because they are there, I think, also by default. But uh, let's put it like this. Some of those findings were from the time when I just started getting into it. And then I never decided to check them again. So this was like one of the first things I did like three and a half years ago when I got into the topic. If you are, yeah, exactly. But I decided I want better performance even under normal conditions without attack. And why do I need to keep the state for 24 hours? That's awesome. Uh, the only thing, the only people who complained were developers in my office um, who used to like run tail on some log, go home, the log was error log, and they'd come in the morning and, well, there was no error generated, but they were like, oh my God, I got disconnected. I mean, put SSH um, keep alive in your configuration or run screen on MOOCs with a clock in it. In it. Then you get every minute a new um, TCP packet. First opening, this was like, also like 60 seconds. I mean, if the player cannot connect in 60 seconds, he will get mad anyway. That's also the way too high. Again, I, 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 I am glad for the RFC, but uh, nobody will wait 60 seconds. They will like close the browser, start again, make a new connection. This will not happen. Yeah, so let's state. And closing fin wait, yes. Sometimes people just like, the computer hangs or the loose connection to the mobile network, yes? So we will, in fact, not even go to closing weight because established will be the last thing we see. Um, you could limit the damage to what tap that happens to your, uh, to your load balancer. Um, while still using FreeBSD 9 a few years ago, I decided it's better to have one world killed. We have each world of the game on separate public IP. I know this is not applicable to every service of every person, um, but, well, it worked for us because, again, we have like hundreds of IP addresses which there are hundreds of worlds of different games. So if you have one of them attacked but you still have other services on this load balancer, you could just say, I do not accept more than, let's say, 15,000 states per game. Normally the numbers are like a few thousand states per most busy worlds. Uh, so 15,000, 50,000 is like totally reasonable. And if the attack happens, you should not get more states. That's not fully true because, well, the states will be purged from time to time. Also, then the adaptive thing will happen, especially, yes, which means some of the traffic will from time to time leak and then create states outgoing of load balancer. And those are, there's no limit and there's like one rule, pass everything going out to the internal network. And that rule, of course, has no limiting. That's a very good question. Uh, I have internal PF uh, enabled also for um, allowing servers to access the internet. I probably could change that. You are right, that's, that's a good thing. But l let's put it that way. That's idea I got while writing this, uh, this presentation. Um, uh, hacking VSD is not my only job and some things work like good enough. I know the problem very well. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. But, but anyway, heading is right. But I, I will, this will be on some slide in a moment. Yeah, um, other thing, you probably want to have states because it's usually faster to check a state than check like, I think on the biggest machines we have like 5,000 rules. Usually it's just five, I mean, I can use like all of the passwords. So if you select that, you look up the, you know, the 
Exactly. Um, but as I said here, if you have internal interfaces, when I, when I started working the, at, uh, at the company, um, there was somebody else making the firewall on PFB4. And since I came to Linux world, I was kind of not aware that I will have second state on the internal side. And we have no state on the internal side. And all the traffic going through internal, out to the internal network, was in fact checking all the uh, rules. Uh, because for every um, load balancer entry, we have one rule on public, one on internal, because you can access load balanced IPs from the same VLAN. So they were in fact checking the internal ones, and they're still being passed because there was no block rule. So well, I think this is a good thing to remember. You need your firewall on both sides or skip on one side. You definitely don't want things to just go through rules that will never match. Other options do not have states. Um, this is a problem we encountered uh, in internal network. We basically had some kind of syslog slash log stash sending traffic uh, from like thousands of virtual machines to central logging place. And they used to do this from random source uh, UDP ports. This created states. In each of them, like single UDP packet went. So the states in PF were hanging on the uh, opening, I guess. And well, they, they, they just waited because this is UDP connection. There is nothing that would close it. And still, after this one packet, another one was sent. I think we had the same problem for pings over the internet. And uh, well, so you probably want to have a rule, at least, again, this is not for um, load balancer, this is for our internal routers, because that goes over the internal network. So there we decided no state for this rule. Makes perfect sense. And I'm honestly not oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, because when you have like 600,000 of states just coming from one service, there's something wrong. Of course, you could tell people not to use UDP for logging, but... And to be honest, I'm not entirely sure about this one. Will set skip will really help you if you have a PF implementation with global locking. Before the global lock happens? Well, you mean this applies at this moment? It applies, yes, yes. I mean, this is what. The restriction that applies depending on the cell. Yeah, I, I, I. I <coughs> Anyway, I encountered this problem while doing my tests for this presentation. I had a NetBSD machine, an OpenBSD machine, and I had set skip on the interface which I'm using to SSH to it, while the traffic to be checked was going through other ones. And well, whatever was going through the other interfaces was killing also my control interface. So it uh -uh, doesn't help that much. That would make that would make sense, but I think it is internal now, or at least it was with FreeBSD9 because I checked much of the code of FreeBSD9 and I seem to remember it. Anyway, um, yeah, this was chapter how can we make PF more resilient, uh, and the last step is to use FreeBSD10 because it works quite much faster, or at least scales nicely. So what performance can we really expect from PF? That's a very good question. Uh, since I got some machines recently, I will not have them in a few weeks again. Uh, yes, there are some Dell servers. They have quite nice CPU, 12 mega, mega, maybe, maybe bytes, L3 cache, six cores. I disabled hyperthreading from my experience. It only slows things down when it comes to handling network traffic. Of course, they have way too much memory, but they were used as hypervisors before. There's the awesome Broadcom. Um, no, this is different Broadcom. This on FreeBSD is handled by BGE, not BCE, but it's still a piece of shit in my opinion. And then I got those awesome uh, Intel cards. They have uh, up till 16 uh, hardware QEs, and they send your traffic through different interrupts to different CPUs. I decided to use NetMap and IPG, IPGen for generating a lot of packets. Um, I'm not interested in bandwidth in bytes per second. I just want to see packets per second because this is basically what happens uh, during DDoS attacks. And I wanted minimal packet size. Again, I'm not interested in bytes per second. Uh, 
clear winner in uh, PF performance are of course OpenBSD and NetBSD because there's the smallest drop. But without PF, uh, for me, FreeBSD 10.3 works the best. Oh, by the way, this is the latest and latest release of Open and NetBSD. Um, there's only one problem. I started by sending the traffic in increasing, um, ah, this comes from uh, 1,000 source IPs so that the network card can really hash it. Although this from what I remember is just for one interrupt per network card. We can configure it. Anyway, there's no, there's no PF here with PF here. Again, PF makes a very small difference on OpenBSD. On FreeBSD, it makes horrible difference. No, but it's uh, a big Maybe, there's only one problem. I started first at 25, I mean, I started at 25,000 packets per second, and I was increasing every 10 seconds to see what happens to the traffic that leaves the machine. I was not verifying the traffic if the packets are fine, IPGen should do it for me, but it was reporting like 90% packets drop, whatever happened, so I just took traffic graphs from Graphite. And well, then we go to one million packets and three million packets. And basically, with NetBSD at three million packets, I got like, uh, a few hundred packets per second leaving the machine. That's very bad. What I like about FreeBSD is that there is not much performance drop in this case. I mean, you can, uh, I mean, you can forward what you can, yeah, like 400,000 packets per second, but if you put way many to the machine, the machine will just forward the minimum, the maximum it can. That would be nice. Unfortunately, I'm not expert on OpenBSD. That would be nice. Anyway, so this is uh, what I got for OpenBSD. This is the traffic increasing incoming, and this is what happens at some point. It just cuts off, goes down, then I press Control C. I start another generation because I didn't want to wait this light. And I go at three million packets per second in well. It still forwards very, very small amount. This is how it works on FreeBSD. I mean, those were default settings as I got the computer, uh, the system installed. Uh, only thing I changed for FreeBSD here was to force the network card to work on single interrupt. So I wanted to have a default system without any tuning. And I made FreeBSD worse, in fact, because normally those cards start with uh, eight interrupts, and I didn't want to use additional, uh, the second NUMA node, because that would be even worse. I wanted to stay on single CPU, um, CPU socket. Um, I must from beginning say uh, 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 that I had some problems with, let's say, getting the same results on every test. Um, but, the, but, the general, but the general, let's say, tendency is, is fine. So if you see like difference, that the difference tests, I had 50,000 less, 50,000 more, I'm sorry. Please, you didn't see it. Uh, anyway, for FreeBSD, be sure to configure network card. This is number of CPUs, of course, uh, no. This is number of, um, of interrupts that the network card was configured to work with. And this is the forwarding <coughs> bandwidth in um, thousands of packets per second. So here we have like one million, two million, three million. There's some magic thingy that you should configure in your Intel card and then voila, it works much better up to eight cores. I was a bit surprised because this goes to the second NUMA node. But uh, I was very disappointed. I couldn't find anything like this in source code of OpenBSD uh, driver. I checked it. I know there are some tunables you, can, you could recompile, but this one doesn't exist. The code seems different, older, I don't know. Uh, huh? uh, EX.process underscore limit, set it to minus one. Again, I couldn't find it in OpenBSD. I was disappointed because, hey, maybe it would also improve. But, well, let's say quality of drivers is also an important thing, and I think for FreeBSD we get this driver from Intel. Maybe it's just older, I don't know. Anyway, here we have comparison of BSD 9.3 and 9.10, and here I have network card tuned, yes, but then we enable and disable PF. 2K means that I had um, 1,000 of source IP addresses, so network card could do the hashing, and, um, well, it creates 2,000 states. Because I'm 
sending very much uh, UDP traffic and well, some of those packets will match existing state, so it's just for the amount of states. And you can clearly see that for FreeBSD uh, 9.3, uh, PF makes it much slower than without PF for BSD 9.3, but of course for FreeBSD 10.3, you can get even better performance without PF, and with PF it just gets just as bad as 9.3 without PF. So I think there is clear improvement, especially what I like here, is that it really scales with the numbers of CPUs you have, or numbers of uh, interrupts of the network card. By default, the interrupts, I think, are bound to CPU, but I also ensure this with a little script. So you get one um, interrupt per CPU um, for both cards, incoming and out outgoing. So well, basically, here I got to like two million of packets per second with PF enabled. This one seemed to be on five cores. The results were a bit inconsistent, but general tendency is as it shows on the picture. You can get more performance if your network card supports multiple interrupts. This not only means you need FreeBSD 10, this also means you have to have proper network card, not like the Broadcom thingy. Increase your hash size. This is kind of interesting. Uh, I was interested how many states can we have and still forward the data. So here is thousands of source addresses results in similar amount of states created. Uh, states are by two. Um, so basically, um, we start at some quite uh, low values from, um, for OpenBSD and FreeBSD 9. For FreeBSD 10, we can go quite high. Um, and the point is, the more states you have, the slower things will become. So basically, if you have like one million of states, and if you do not increase your hash size in FreeBSD 10 for the state table, the performance drops horribly. If you say, hey, I want a hash of one million size. I, to be honest, I'm not supposed this really fits in the CPU cache, as you said, but hey, it still gives very much improvement. I mean, here I had like five million of states in, um, in PF with hash size of one uh, megabyte, I still get like 1,200,000 packets forwarded per second from, um, from 2 million at the beginning, while without increasing this hash, this goes uh, worse uh, than the implementations with you, which use the tree for searching. So yes, your hash can be faster, but you may have to make it bigger. But at the beginning, the bigger hash makes it a bit smaller. But to be honest, I'm not sure if this is stati statistically significant because as I said, I had some problems replicating some results. So maybe let's disregard my last note. But anyway, you want to make the hash bigger. Um, i sorry, I don't have graphs for this. But there are other things that work better. I, I said that this, uh, the topic of the presentation was what happens to the PF when you have DDoSes and other malicious traffic. Other malicious traffic can be your customers, basically. If we have, I, I said I, I had two load balancers. I cannot use PF sense between the, uh, PF sync between them uh, because root two is not working with uh, PF sync. But it means that if I have a CARP or BGP failover, that means one machine dies, the other machine has to create I mean, all the clients will stop, start going F5, 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 and then it, the, the, the legitimate customers will become the DDoS attack, basically. Um, so what, what happens is that, just a moment, there will be a short period where all the clients that want to connect to you will, in fact, create new states. Maybe more, maybe they get angry and they press this button uh, however they wish. Um, so yeah, with FreeBSD 9, I could basically expect the machine to be like totally frozen after such switch for like 30 seconds, one minute. Like you SSH to it and your session froze,s you want to run top. You see IRQ load full on all CPUs and you cannot do anything. With FreeBSD 10, so the uh, implementation that uses this granular locking, this thing doesn't happen. The states are like recreated within like a second or two. So again, I'm afraid I do not have graph for this. Works better for me, trademark. Uh, yes. Um, now, let, let's, let, so what could we do to have PF 
even a better thing. Uh, I have some ideas for performance improvements. Um, as we discussed before, the source nodes get created also for SYN flats. We don't need source nodes for unlegitimate customers. So why not create a source node only for states that get fully established? I had a working patch on BSD9. I just never implemented it on BSD10, and I regret it every time we get a SYN flat. <laughs> the problem is that now we have automatic, um, automatic um, configuration of um, routing to this um, DDoS mitigation service, so kind of pressure on improving PF in my case dropped because we can route to this uh, external service like within 10 seconds after DDoS starts. So I kind of lowered the pressure in it, but hey, it, it can be done. It can be done. The code is ugly, but it can be done. Let's call it deferred source node creation. Why not? Uh, probably you don't really want it for legitimate customers all the time, and maybe we could have Synproxy operation being enabled only when such attack happens. Maybe differently locked. Maybe exactly. Maybe you could some do some tricks like pre-allocate. I know on um, BSD um, Euro BSD Con in Stockholm, you told me that um, one of the things was um, memory allocation was slowed. So I think, hey, why not pre-allocate one million of states and just use them for mm -hmm. such thing? But syn proxy would be a nice thing, especially if syn proxy would not create a state. Um, I, I, I I think I've seen this is now available in Red Hat Seven in Linux. Like for since a few months, maybe I don't I don't remember exactly. Maybe. If I have free time. <laughs> anyway, uh, last but not the least, there is possibility to configure Eric's uh, receive hashing on your network cards. I think in Linux, uh, I've seen um, that there was some proposal for FreeBSD for. Um, this Intel card, I think those very expensive other network cards can do that, but there is no general algorithm. But if I had one, could I say, and again, from my network point of view, I can, uh, for example, set a different priority to different IP address on the switches, because that's what my automatic QoS does. Could I send it only to one CPU and have other CPUs working? But of course, this requires multi-CPU implementation of PF. Um, there's not only performance that I would like to see improved, there's also ideas that are, in my opinion, uh, important to load balancing. There's one little problem that if you have, um, if you create a rule and you say forward port 80 and 443 to this machine, this in fact creates two separate rules in PF. And they have separate uh, source nodes because source nodes are per rule. And um, well, this is kind of bad for this, my particular use case as load balancer. Um, because, well, player connects first to one server on port 80 and then gets directed to other one on port 443. I had my other sysadmins complaining for this. So I don't know. The, the, um, the, the thing to search for a source node is basically um, part of the key to find a source node is, I think, um, pointer, to the, um, pointer to the rule. So if you have multiple rules, they cannot share at least in FreeBSD. So maybe per table name or per label, I don't know. I didn't really think how to implement that. I, I think this could be an interesting feature. This would, of course, change the behavior, so maybe it should be configurable. I'm not really sure whether it will do that for this identity. I don't suppose so, because that would change the behavior. And again, this is changing behavior. Um, one thing. One thing that we have is basically um, whenever a server goes down, I want all customers to get disconnected from that server. That basically means that I want to also remove source nodes so that this customer doesn't connect anymore to given server, um, but then I need to do it by basically table name used. Normally, if you remove source nodes, they are by target IP, but maybe target IP has different ports forwarded by different rules in my load balancer and I only want one of the ports to be dropped because only the web server went down, but for example, Node.js server is still up. 
Um, this is very interesting feature I, um, I have. Um, basically, what happens if, if, I, if I kill this source node, if I disconnect the player from a broken server, uh, player's web browser is never notified that this TCP connection is dead. The browser will still try to send um, HTTP requests through existing um, TCP um, socket, the existing TCP stream. Um, so it is a really nice idea when, when you kill a state on the load balancer to inject uh, RSTs, send one RST to the customer, and also I send one RST to the web server, which is, let's say, not that much important, but at least the server will not try if it goes back online. I don't know, maybe it was a short network issue. Yeah. Yeah, and this one works. Yep. Yep. Uh, the internal side is a bit tricky with root 2, and this is the same problem as synproxy. Um, for histological reasons. <laughs> check out, check out, um, Maybe I could. I could check. Anyway, since let's say we are we are at the root too. Yes, I'm sorry. It is used. What what? Uh, oh uh, oh, there was one point I missed. Apart from root two, I want to tunnel two. If I want to do layer, which layer it is? The one that Facebook does. They encapsulate packets in, in, in gray, I think, and then send it to machines. And of course, then you need direct server return. But I don't think you can do Synproxy with direct server return, to be honest. But anyway, Synproxy doesn't work with root 2. It would be nice to have it. And pfsync doesn't work with root 2. If I had working pfsync, I could say my load balancers are active-active. They are not. Uh, I believe this doesn't work in OpenBSD. I, for some things, for some things, I checked the code and I checked mailing lists, and I think this one was mentioned as not working with some unofficial patches. And this is kind of, uh, I mean, if root two is there, it would be nice to have it working. Anyway, let's let's move to the next slide. Conclusions. Yes, it's 2016, and you can still use FreeBSD. All those guys saying, uh, "Why don't you use Linux in LDS?" You can tell them, "Hey, because it works." Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a project from the last century, although it requires a bit of love and care, and, but it, it, it does the work. Um, I think, this is like conclusion from making this presentation, having a syn proxy that could catch those DDO, distributed denial of service attacks, it could be possible if we had syn proxy working with root 2, at least for my case, on FreeBSD 9, SynFlat is totally dead router because you've seen the graphs. If you put too many things that create states, nothing will get forwarded properly. Um, tuning firewall timeouts greatly improve things for my company. So I think the defaults are like unreasonably RFC compatible. Uh, question that Henning here raised, and I raised it to myself, do I need internal firewalling? Can I just do set skip on internal network? I would have to rewrite the rules which block servers from accessing the internet because they are now on the internal side and they would have to be done on the public side and get a modern hardware. Of course, the higher the CPU clock you have, the better for typical things, but with what we have in FreeBSD 10, this really makes change. The conclusion of the field was the footnote number two is wrong. Taking all of the implementations and stretch it from the leads to us. Mm -hmm. So, it's a free BSD this, uh, presentation. I'm sorry. In the end, in the end, we don't have all that much proper human assets back yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many questions, but maybe other people want to ask something. Um, the question was how long I use root 2. I, I use it, um, I started working at this awesome company in 2012. It was already there. Okay. 
So it's, it is some years, and it, again, it No, the, the code is so horrible. Ah, the question was, what is test tool, which I mentioned. Um, yeah, the code is so horrible, I'm ashamed of showing it. <laughs> it's not good enough, as some people use the word today. Uh, so it's a custom written tool. Uh, it basically performs health checks, can do things like HTTP check, HTTPS, ping, limited DNS. One crazy person added um, PostgreSQL check. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice tool written in C. We just deploy it on every machine. And then it has a list of um, nodes behind the load balancer, performs the checks like every two, three seconds. When things fail, it waits for them to fail many times and then removes, then it modifies the tables we use for forwarding. So we remove a, whole, a node from the table and then we say this node is dead. As part from removing node, it also kills the uh, source nodes going to, th uh, to this one, kills the states. Uh, I mean, this is done by PF internally. It just say, uh, uh, it just tells uh, PFCTL, remove this source node with its states with injecting RST. So things are done inside PF, but of course the tool uh, manages it. The question was, um, what happens on the failover scenarios? Yes, people, clients have to reestablish the connections, although I don't suppose they really have to hit a five in most cases, because um, I think one of the games we have in Flash, I think this one has uh, reestablishes the connection to exchange data in the background, because it's a Flash-based application, so we don't have to download it, it just makes the request. Now the player clicked on this building, give him more gold or whatever. So I think this is done kind of in background, although of course you will have all the clients uh, connecting again. You're welcome. The question was if we can differ, differ, differentiate. differentiate between uh, real customers and attackers, or just and attackers. <sighs> Unfortunately, games connect to port 80 and 443 for most things. There are also some things which go to different ports, depends on the game. So those ports, of course, do not get attacked. To be honest, I, I, do, I don't suppose so, but I, as a network admin, I had another idea in mind, like basically feeding PF with information about geolocation, because, well, if this is a Romanian market and you suddenly get connections from China, maybe at least keep the ones from Romania alive. That was an idea, but never basically came. But since game markets are per location, we could maybe use it to uh, see the difference between um, legitimate and uh, connections and attacks. Yes. So one of our standard providers has the ability to select a flat call and get somebody to just to talk to you about it at the top end. Could you please? So they, you can just select an announcement of your, of your network interface. Ah, so you're asking about how the DDoS protection works. I can, I, we can talk about it offline. I could give you a link to my other presentation. Okay. Uh, but basically, yes, through, uh, through um, DDoS mitigation services, you announce your prefixes from their pop, uh, points of presence. Yep. So they steal the traffic which normally would go to our primary provider slash 17 or whatever it is. And then um, they clean the traffic and return it uh, to us through a tunnel. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>